Yep. Hello and welcome to today's online exclusive session with Creamy Institute, Nottingham, UK, and Rags Homeschooling. We're really excited with the interview today. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we've been uh, trying to get this interview aligned for a while and we really appreciate the special guest that um, managed to take time out, precious time, to join us today. Our special guest today is Elizabeth Hansen, who's come all, well, I'll say come, but she joined us all the way from California, USA, Alhamdulillah. Uh, we really appreciate that. She's actually a, a parenting and education expert and she's got a website called smarthomeschooler.com and she's been doing it for many, many years. So we're really, she's got massive amounts of experience. So we're really excited that she could come and join us, especially in today's time when we go through the current global pandemic of COVID-19, where a lot of parents are confused at the same time and concerned about the children's, not just health, but their education as well. So we found this to be a great a time and an opportunity for the parents to join in today's discussion and listen to Elizabeth Hudson directly and ask any questions they may have in regards to smart home schooling. Um, Elizabeth Hansen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Happy to be here. Thank you. We really appreciate you taking time out. It's, um, we're really excited here in Nottingham that you could actually take time out and join us, especially with someone with so much experience as yourself. Well, I appreciate that you're even taking the time to do a session on this, this topic because I think it's one of the most important topics today. So. Definitely in today's world, it's definitely that's something that's really needed. I think even myself, because I've got children myself, so it's a really confusing topic. We weren't sure, you know, the areas, the issues around it. And now that a lot of children are uh, here um, at home within the confines of uh, the house, we're, now we're all of a sudden we're thinking, uh, what do we do? We're running around like headless chicken, not knowing what to do. But before we can uh, start the um, discussion itself, if you could just let the, the viewers and the listeners know exactly about your background in terms of your experience and how you got into homeschooling, please. Sure. I actually started out in Chinese medicine. Well, actually, let me go way back. When I was a child, I had this dream of being a teacher. And through the course of my life and different experiences, I actually, be I was always very interested in health. So my, my first career was actually in Chinese medicine. And so through that, I developed a very, very comprehensive, very wholesome, holistic, unified way of looking at really everything because that's how your mind is trained through a program like that. And then as I, uh, you know, as the years went on, I had children, I encountered John Taylor Gatto, I became familiar with his work. And I think the real turning point for me was just understanding what was going on in the school system, in government school. I think you have different names for it than we do here. We call it public school. I think you call it private school, but I'm going to say government schooling for today just to keep it clear. But once I understood what was going on there and the problems with it, and having been a product of that system, I understand firsthand of that's what happened. And it just it was just something I was not willing to have for my own children. And I'm also just the kind of person that, okay, if I'm not going to do that for my children, I need to let everybody know they shouldn't do that for their children either. And so that's really how I transitioned from my, my background, my work in Chinese medicine into education and then also parenting because one of the struggles, one of the questions I got asked over the years is, how do I make my child do this? How do I make my child do that? And I realized, okay, these, you know, and I would always say, well, that's kind of a parenting question. I realized, no, I actually need to tackle it because we're parents and we're homeschooling. And so I, I, it took me a long time to find somebody who I really trusted and who made sense, but I did find somebody. So I became a certified parenting coach through a program that's called Love and Leadership. And so I, I very much have a very comprehensive program really in understanding how to raise and educate a child. So that's, that's how we came to be here today. <laughs> Fantastic. So you went on and obviously created a website uh, smarthomeschooler.com. Tell us about that. Do you find something, did you find the website more important than actually having live in, you know, classes in like a building or, or something? Well, I find the younger generation is very, you know, the younger gener generation who are having children are very much online. And also this isn't a problem that's isolated to California where I am. This has now mm. become a universal problem. And it's something that we need to really work collectively towards as parents to really correct. And so I'm, I'm interested in working with anyone who is interested in really mustering up the courage to deal with the problem of how we raise our children and how do we educate them. So yes, I love, I prefer to teach, you know, in 
in a real space with real people. That is my preference. And I think that's every teacher's preference. It's very different teaching online, but because yeah. of what I'm trying to do the online format that's making the most sense, but I'm happy to teach privately too. I just, I just, I mean, obviously in this day and age, we can't really do anything social unless we can yeah. I mean, I'm happy to do that too. And, and I have done that. I have gone, you know, out lectured and so forth. Um, yes, no, I, I love teaching in person too. Now, I know due to the current COVID situation, everyone's lives have changed. You know, people look into new ways of working. Everything's gone digital, really. So in terms of pre-COVID and COVID, has that affected your work? Because you were mainly online anyway, weren't you? Well, I definitely find that... I mean, I definitely appeal to a certain segment of the population. And I mean, you really have to muster up courage to really become independent of government schooling. And I find that's the biggest struggle for people. And so once, once people understand why they don't want to be with the government schooling programs, because they now offer these, you know, homeschooling programs, um, then, you know, then it's a certain mindset. And it's really that mindset that I work with. So I'm trying to educate people in that mindset, really. So in terms of the COVID pandemic, I think it's in a way very sad what's happened because I don't see people homeschooling. I see people stuck home with kids that are stuck in front of computers and the kids are miserable and the parents are miserable and nobody knows what to do. And it's like, you know, but then you see these few parents who are saying, this is insane and I don't want it anymore. And they're checking out and they're, and they're basically, those are the people that I'm working with, people that are willing you know, the people that are understanding, like, this is, this is not what we should be doing with our children. Our children should not be sitting in front of computers all day. It's, you know, I mean, this just isn't, this isn't how children get educated. And so those are, yeah, so that's, so I would say that people are transitioning from that. They're kind of realizing this whole online thing isn't working and taking it on themselves. So, yes. Okay, so my question for, for you is, can online learning really replace face-to-face -face teaching? No. No. Uh, university students and they're both home online and they both were in the school system before they uh, everything went online right like pre-covid they were in, in in college and now it's COVID, now now they're online no they and what they've said to me is thank god we were homeschooled because we know how to teach ourselves mm. I saw, you know very complex math um you know he's taking complex math courses and he's doing like mathematical proofs and I mean, it's just a world I don't understand, but all I know is that he's having to spend so much time teaching himself because the teachers, first of all, they're not trained to teach online. They're struggling and they don't like it. And a lot of their time is consumed with these really silly questions that kids have to ask, send them emails, but then, then have to take their time to reply to because you just can't have that one-on-one -on -one conversation in class, you know? And so, and in addition, the teaching is so ineffective that no, these kids are having to figure out what to do and how to teach themselves. And, and that way my kids have a head start because they, they were homeschooled. And it's one of the things you teach a child when you're homeschooling to learn, right? Like how do you tackle any subject and, and how do you teach yourself? And, but no, there's no replacement for a real teacher. And I don't think we need studies to prove that. I think we just need the, you know, when we learn things, I mean, you know, I kind of, I, I was thinking about this, um, Recently, I was just, I was kind of reflecting on just the difference between, I mean, I think a lot about online learning versus real learning because there's just zero comparison. But when I, when I was very young, I just, I have this very vivid memory of actually being in England. I lived there for six years or seven years. And I had a friend who was teaching me how to make scones, you know, and it's a very particular way that you make scones from scratch. And it was just like having her there, my teacher, my cooking teacher, because I was young and she was older and, and having her work through the process with me. First of all, there's a whole like relationship bonding that happens there. It's, a, it's fun, it's interesting, it's alive, it's dynamic, right? And then I started to kind of, you know, make my scones and I had very heavy hands and I was kind of like just, you know, molding it all together. She's like, no, no, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. How can I know? I don't know how to make scones. And that's not something you can get from a book and it's not something you can get from a teacher online because she could look at me and she could see what I was doing wrong, where my errors were, and she could correct them. And so she actually could teach me, like now I make really great uh, pastry, you know, and, but she taught me and I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have happened in that same way had I been struggling on my own or doing it online. And I think the thing with online learning is that it's just, you, you're not getting that direct relationship with the teacher, that teacher is there to impart his love of his subject to you. It's not happening through this online this online relationship. And so, so much of it is missed. And then the nuances of learning, okay, 
where is a student, where, where are they not comprehending something? Where are they missing something? And you correct it. I'll give you another example. When you're homeschooling your children, we do penmanship, right? And, and so a lot of parents will just, and I was guilty of this too in the beginning until I realized, hey, you can't do that. Well, give the children the book because it's all right there. You know, it's like, you know, they show you, you know, the lines are there. They show you how to draw the letter. I mean, it just seems like it's just so easy. So we'll hand the child the book and tell them, okay, you know, do this page of penmanship. But the truth is the child doesn't know when they're making mistakes, right? And so the parent actually has to sit with them and they've got to, and so they can say, no, no, you're, you know, you may, you need to make the line a little taller. Don't press so hard, make the circle rounder. Do you know what I mean? You're there to correct their mistakes and guide them through the process. That can't, that's not happening online and these kids are really struggling. That's the learning aspect of it and just a part of the learning aspect of it. But what about the physical, the neurological, like, I mean, these children that are on computers for long periods of time, like these kids at the game a lot, you know, I mean, we have, we have cases of kids who've had strokes because they're so addicted. They just sit there for days until they get blood clots. And I mean, it's not like it happens every day, but I mean, it's so unhealthy to be sitting in front of a computer. But the thing that worries me the most is that it's habit forming. And the more you have your child doing something, and it's also, there's something very alluring about a screen. If you've ever, you know, I lived in Morocco for a year and every time you go to somebody's house, like the minute you walk through the door, they turn the TV on and <laughs> have this conversation, but the TV's on. And so it's like, you know, so you'll talk about something and then everybody goes to the TV, you know, and then you kind of pull yourself away and then you talk about something else. And then, it, and it's like that, right? Cause it, it has this pool on us. So it's, it's habit for me for these children to be sitting in front of computers all day long. This isn't just about online learning. Like this is about how are they living their lives? What are the habits that they're developing when they're young? For sure, they're not developing a reading habit because, you know, they're giving books online to read, you know, and parents somehow think it's okay to buy kids Kindle and things like that, but it's not. Like they need sensory experiences. They need to feel things. They need to see things in, in a third dimensional world, not a two dimensional world. So, I mean, there's just so many physical problems and neurological problems that are happening as a result of online learning and of all the technologies. And then also just the social aspect of it too. So uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there. It really is, open to the world is, what it's, is what it's doing. And so, so much easier to homeschool without technology. And that's what I don't think people understand. That's what I try. That's what I'm really trying to educate people about now. It's so much easier without technology and it's so much more fun. Definitely. Now, the thing is a lot of parents nowadays are, Concerned, I think rightly concerned that home education cannot replace public school education. And the reason for that is they think um, they, they won't be able to meet the needs of the child, or maybe they don't understand the exact needs of the child, so they think they can't meet it. So they need to set, shove them in public school where they'll mix with everybody and they'll learn the right life skills that they need. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's a myth. I think it's definitely misunderstanding. I think parents overlook the fact that they, they are teachers to their children, but whether or not they, they recognize that they, they are teachers to their children. We're always teaching our children. We, our children come into the world and they start learning, right? They start developing the minute they're, they're here and they don't stop. And if we raise them well in those early years, that natural love of learning they have will continue, but we don't. And we put them into schools and it gets smashed and, and they don't grow up to be lovers of knowledge and they lose our curiosity and they lose all these things that come with that like imagination and, and really brilliance. And so, so no, I, I don't think that's true. I think it's very untrue. I, I think a parent can do a far better job teaching their child at home for many reasons. One, you get to, you know, you can teach them on real books real things that matter in life and you can teach them the things that they need to learn to become an educated person and you can also raise them in a wholesome environment where they're exposed to good things there's this idea that no you know children need to come to terms with the reality of the world yes that's true but in its own time you know you can't force a flower to bloom you need to give things our time children have developmental stages and so you do want to keep them in a bubble as much as you can when they're really young in those early years and eventually they, you know, you move them into the world and it's not like suddenly they get this rude awakening. No, it's, it's a gradual process. It's not that we want to raise our children in bubbles and it's not that we want to keep them yeah. isolated at all, but we want to protect their innocence during that period when it's so critical to protect it. In terms of 
the social skills. No, it's completely the opposite. And I think the, the person who really is, you know, talks about this uh, most effectively is a man called Gabriel Malte. He's a doctor from Canada. And he, he wrote a book called Hold On To Your Kids. And it's all about the how the, the bond between the family gets broken down once kids go into school and they then become more allied with their peers. And, and that's where you get the peer pressure and you know the values in the home are suddenly, you know, the kids turn it back on them and they just grow up with very different values. And, and so he's really making a perfect argument for homeschooling, but he doesn't realize it. <laughs> and he never yeah. mentioned it. he doesn't even realize it. But it is a perfect argument for homeschooling because children, when they're in it, I mean, children, social skills are something that we learn, right? It, they don't just happen. We have to learn them. We have to develop them. And when you have children, and so we develop them by practice, by interacting with other people in real life. And when you have children in, a, in classrooms from the time they're three, four years of age, and they're in a classroom with children their own age, and that's it, you know, for eight hours a day. Where is their opportunity to develop social skills? They're not with younger people taking care of them, learning how to, you know, to be kind to them and to help them. They're not with older people gaining wisdom and learning how to have conversations about things outside of school. They're just stuck with kids their own age. And children who are stuck with children their own age all day, they tend to go down to the youngest child in the class. So it really breeds immaturity is what it does. You'll find with homeschooled children that they are very capable of having conversations with people of all ages about all sorts of different things because they're learning all sorts of different things because much of homeschooling, I don't want to say much of it, but I mean, a lot of it is, is really, you know, if you, if you really know how to homeschool and you've, you've got a handle on things, you're able to go with your children's interests to some degree. I'm not a fan of unschooling at all. But I am a fan of recognizing what your children's interests are and, and nurturing those. So it is amazing the things that children will learn on their own just because they love learning when they're homeschooled. It's not going to happen in the system. And what about the yeah. I think learning at home, obviously, you can only, if, if you visualize yourself, you can see that the child learns at their own pace when they're comfortable. So there's no pressure on them and the, the, no one's looking down at them or anything like that. But at oh, school, the, the, sorry, what was that? I was going to say that's another point that we should we should address too. It's it's a good point you just made. Because I was going to say, because at school you're another number in the classroom, and you may not get that attention that's required. It's wait till your turn. So maybe you want to expand on that. Well, I think I think what you said about children um, being taught as a group and not going at their own pace is really it's one of the hallmarks of homeschooling. When children are taught at the level of a in a group setting in a large group setting where they're a very very different developmental levels because you have to understand we have a cutoff date right for when a child can enter first grade and that cutoff date there's a year often you know in most classrooms there's a year between a year difference between the eldest children in the class and the youngest child in the class that's a whole year and so think of the difference between a five-year-old and a six-year-old or a six-year-old and a seven-year-old or a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old there's a huge developmental difference so you have the youngest child in the class and you have the oldest child in the class. And what happens is the oldest child, the, the teacher has to teach to the average, right? She has to kind of teach to that middle level of those grade, of those ages. And so the older children get bored or they get singled out as a nerd and the younger children can't keep up and they decide they're really stupid. And so most high school dropouts, a large percent of high school dropouts can be related to children who went to school, who were that youngest child in the class. And I was that youngest child in the class, and you do. And I remember, uh, you know, experiences of my own um, elementary education where I thought I was stupid because I was the youngest child and I was being taught concepts I just wasn't ready to learn. But as a child, you don't know that. And, and because the school system doesn't recognize developmental levels, they don't, they, they're not developing curriculum according to that. So no, a lot of children get really harmed in the system because of that. And they're just not able to realize that intellectual potential. And, and yeah, and that is a big concern. So when you're homeschooling, you are able to go at their own pace. And you and because it, the learning is it's one-on-one, -on -one, they learn so much more in, in far less time, which means they can learn so much more over the span of their childhood education. Right. So yeah, that's now you might yeah. 
you may have answered it slightly there, my next question, but a lot of people that are, that are listening today or are watching, they may, be, they may be convinced, thinking, yeah, actually, it does make sense, and I understand the benefits of uh, homeschool, homeschooling over uh, public schooling, but can homeschooling really achieve the educational standard that a public school can give you? I, I mean, it just so far exceeds it. It's, there's no comparison. I think if you see, if, I mean, if you, all the parent has to do is go online and do a search on homeschool children. And I think you'll find plenty of examples. And many people in our history, great, you know, our history were homeschool children. I mean, your aristocracy in England, I think until Princess Diana, they were always tutored. They had private tutors in the home. They, they were put into schools. Not even, not even your um, Ali, you know, they were tutored. Why? Because they're being raised to be leaders. And that is what you're doing when you're giving your child an individual education. You're raising your child to be a leader of himself, if, if not anything he embarks on to do. You know, if he, if he assumes a leadership role in life, I mean, you're training him for that. But most importantly, you're training him to lead himself, right? And so, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of telling right in that. So, no, I totally disagree with anybody who thinks that because I know it's not true. And if you do a search online and do a search for historical figures that were home so right, you'll be amazed at all the people that come up. And sometimes they don't even start till they're older. Like one of our greatest minds in America was Alexander Hamilton. He was one of the founding fathers and he, he had a terrible childhood. And I don't think he started studying until he formally, or not even formally, I think he was more self-taught in the beginning until he was about 12 years old. And um, he only had the career he had because he had a, he had a, a natural skill at writing and he wrote something about a hurricane and, and it was recognized that well we have this brilliant man on this island and so he it, his whole life changed he was just uh, facilitating going to the states and studying but you know same thing with george washington they didn't they didn't even start their education until later and, and george washington wasn't even that well educated but i uh, compared to the others but um yeah so this idea that they've got to learn all these things at these early ages i mean that's not true either it's actually the opposite you don't want to teach a really early a really young child because you can actually kill that love of learning in them uh, when it's formalized too young. Yeah. Yeah, so I, no, think yeah I, I think it's really very much the opposite. I think homeschool children get into top colleges if that is what the parent and the family are striving for. I think I don't, I think your child is, and, and uh, we were talking about homeschooling, we really should have defined it in the beginning because there's a lot of misconceptions about what it is. So when I talk about homeschooling, I'm not talking about charter schools. Like in our country, charter school students who go under the, some of them go under the label of homeschool, they're actually enrolled in the public school system. So they're actually considered public school students. The studies that are done on homeschoolers are those children whose parents are not working in the system. They've actually just completely, there's no ties to the state. They've assumed full responsibility for their child's education. Those are the children that the studies are done on. And though, that's where you see the great examples come out of these, of these, you know, people that go on to do wonderful things. And we're saying that now we have a whole generation of homeschoolers that are, you know, just embarking on interesting businesses and, and doing interesting things, so. I think there's, a, there's a quite a few uh, key attributes of a child learning at home as well. Obviously, one thing is confidence. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, you know, being in a safe home environment. Because as you know, there's, on the news constantly, you're hearing something's happening in school, there's bullying, the people, uh, children committing suicide due to bullying and so on. So there's a lot of negative effects of being around people of a similar age where these things are happening on a regular basis. So there's a lot of negativity there as well. And it's like I say, you're in a safe, safe home environment where you can learn at your own pace and become more confident. And at the same time, having avoided all these neg uh, negative um, social aspects of schools as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that children who are homeschooled do have a more natural confidence because they they're, they're very they're very confident in their opinions because it doesn't occur to them that they have to think any other way than the way they think. They're just not trying to think like everybody else. So they're very yeah. comfortable in their opinions and their understanding of things. And yeah. I, th I do, and I think you know when you think about confidence, it's this we confuse it with self esteem. And it's really children gain confidence from doing things and, and learning to do them well. And then they become confident they can do something well. But I think when children are homeschooled, they definitely do develop confidence in, in learning and in their ability to learn and things that they do learn. Yeah. I know when I was uh, listening to a lecture from a well-known uh, speaker in America, he, he was saying that, um, that someone, his friend asked him the question, because he homeschools his children as well, and he was asked the question, don't you fear that your children will miss out on the social aspects or going to advantage of going to school? He said, that's exactly what I'm taking them away from. That's the reason the homeschooling is to be taken away from that social uh, gathering. Yeah, I, well, 
well, that's why I say it's a myth. I, I think if you really think about it, do you really want your children exposed to drugs and yeah, and, you know, the 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 thing, the, the violence and the bullying and I mean, it's just a very it's a very uh, for want of a better word, it just the school environment does not support raising children with good character. And in the end, you want to raise decent children. I mean, I mean you want to be living in a, in a world with decent people. And, and we're really lucky. I mean, in our country, you know, and I don't like any of our presidents, uh, the president's choices that we've had uh, for recent years or many years. Really. But, you know, that we voted for Donald Trump and, and somebody asked, well, what would the founding fathers have have thought about that and i mean they wouldn't have thought about it he would have been completely ostracized from society he would have never been considered so this idea that it's somehow okay to put our kids in these environments and that we or we expect them to somehow maintain our values that that's that's been studied and it's proven to not not actually work out that way you're putting your children into a very secular system with a certain agenda and, and there's very negative influences in that system. I mean, just the social skills that children are learning in that system are very, they're, they're negative social skills to some degree. And they, they found that after, and these studies are done in America, that by the time a child graduates from high school, they no longer, 75% of them no longer share the values of their parents. Uh, the, actually, you know what, that was done more in, in, in terms of religion. 75% of them no longer share the religion of their parents. They don't practice it. And, and so you've got to extend that to values, obviously, right? So yes, it's, I, I mean, if, if, if you agree with the ideology in, in the government schooling, you have no problem, <laughs> it's fine, why not? But if you don't agree with it, you should, you know, you really do need to think twice because they will undermine what you're trying to, to raise your children to become. Now, I, I've, been, I've been following you on Facebook for a few years and I'm really impressed with the work that you're doing and I've watched your videos and I've seen some comments on, Obviously, one thing I really, um, really like is, uh, and I actually was scrolling on your website today, and you had a comment there from John Taylor Gatto as well, and um, I know he's a very well known figure through, globally, really, and um, the, the amount of work that he's done to expose public school, and I've actually purchased a few of his books now as well. I'm really excited after this conversation with yourself. I just want to open his books and start reading and see exactly what he's saying. But um, it's really raised the interest. And um, having someone like him who's recommended you as well, I think that's a big thing. Um, so if you can just tell us about um, your, your home uh, school uh, website and your link with John Taylor Gatto. I think a lot of people do know, know John Taylor Gatto and how you've worked with him in terms of promoting this message that you have. Right. I first met John Taylor Gatto. Well, actually, my father first discovered him. I think it was in 1998 when he wrote his op-ed to the Wall Street Journal saying it was titled, I Quit, I Think. And it was his announcement that he was right now leaving public school as a teacher. And this was a man who'd won several awards, teaching awards in both the state and the city as the best teacher of the year. I think he won four awards, which is pretty phenomenal. Wow. He was also a man who was older. Uh, he, was, he was probably around my age now. He was very close to retirement. And they get a pension too, you know, so to, to quit right at that point, one, it took, I mean, that's a man who's, who's really operating from a very deep moral principle because he came to the conclusion over his course of his career that there was more harm. He was doing more harm teaching that system than he was doing with these children, and he just couldn't do it anymore to happen. So he left at a time where he was like very close to getting a pension, which I think is pretty, I mean, that just shows the, the, the integrity of his character. And so he was a very remarkable, very brilliant man, but he went on to have another career, which he didn't anticipate having. And, and I think that is what happens when you do things for the right reason, you know, good will come from it. And so he ended up with a whole other career and he started writing bikes, uh, bikes <laughs> books. He started lecturing about the, the um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, um, I heard this, the word is this, you slipped my, the underground history of American, uh, of, of education, which is around the world now. It's not just, not just in America, as we know. And, um, and so, yeah, so we invited him into, so my father first discovered him. And then in 2003, I put together an education conference. I wanted him to come out and speak. He was the main speaker and he did. And, and, and we established a relationship at that point. I, sometimes you meet somebody, you feel like you've known them th their whole life. And he actually was very much like my father. And he was from the same um, part of the country as my father, you know, very close in age. And he, he just was so much like my father. And, and when we met, he told me I was just like his daughter. So we, we, we just had this very, uh, a sweet connection in a way and then and then he came out the next year he came out he came out uh, I think three times and then 
and then I was very busy. You know, he's told me, write me, you know, anytime you have a question, he'd like to talk over the telephone. He, he really didn't like that. He could traumatize me when he was younger and he'd, he'd explain the whole story to me, but he liked you to write. And I never did. I was always, I was always actually really shy to, but, um, but we stayed in touch and over the, you know, he then had a stroke. He was out here giving a lecture and I think within months he'd had a stroke and he'd become um, paralyzed, which was very tragic. And then anyways, it was just kind of a fluke in the end. We had a very uh, interesting relationship because he, he had sent me a manuscript. I, I, I just had this funny, feeling to send him this, this children's rhyme book that I just published. And it was just kind of funny, it was around Christmas time. And I thought, you know, I, I just had this funny feeling to send him. It was completely irrational because what would he have anything to do with children's rhymes? I don't, it just, and I remember putting it in the mail slot just thinking, why am I sending him this? <laughs> you know, it was just, that it was kind of like, I just felt like I had to send it to him. Anyways, he sent me a rhyme that he'd written in return and it had been published. And he said, well, publish it. And I said, okay. <laughs> and he told me, I don't want to hear about it. I said, okay. Um, but I, I wasn't, so what happened was I started, I, I had a vision for this book immediately and, and I wanted it to be amazing. And so I started to, uh, you know, I started to send him some samples of the illustration. It was about a spider uh, and the CIA. And, and of course he's got his woven, you know, un underlying um, story through it. I mean, it's very John, very much John Taylor Gatto. <laughs> and so I, anyways, once he saw the quality of work that I was doing, he of course became super interested. Well, it was kind of an interesting point in both of our lives because he, he, he was paralyzed and the book gave him a lot of hope and he was so excited about it. Uh, but then his wife had a stroke and his best friend died and, and another like his right-hand man and his work died. And at the same time, my, my, both my parents died. And so we, it was just kind of this really intense period and that we just, I had, we had a really close relationship during that whole process, it was probably about three years. Um, and some of it had to do with education and, and a lot of it didn't. But um, he, he was a very remarkable man. He did some really amazing work and he really, you know, he really helped people to understand why you don't want your children in the system. And the, you know, people, I, I had a friend ask me after my kids were grown, cause I was working I, you know, I was a breadwinner and I'm homeschooling and my life is very, very busy. And some days it's even very, very, you know, like, <laughs> like I need a break busy. And he said to me, why did you do it? And I said to him, if you knew what I knew, you'd understand that I didn't have a choice. Like once you really get what's going on, there is no longer a choice. You just have to make it work in the best way that you can. And I always tell parents like, you're just doing the best job you can do. So you don't have to do a perfect job. But whatever your best is, for sure, it's going to be better than what they're going to get in government schooling. I have no doubt about that. No doubt. Okay, now I know in, in, in certain countries, obviously, the laws are different in terms of the government laws and so on. But in, in terms of um, in, in America, I don't know how it is there, but uh, for example, here in the UK, there's a lot of obviously a new... Uh, beliefs or certain because obviously there's a lot of people of different religions and so on so they've got different belief systems now they're sending these children to public schools and are they being forced upon that uh, their children have to learn about certain issues or certain things that the parents don't feel comfortable with now a lot of us say that even if your children are at home school they will still have to learn this it have to be included in the syllabus is that correct in america or does that apply globally no no absolutely i've had parents calling from the uk i had one lady call me i actually have I have quite a few UK students. I, I um, yeah, I always really, really appreciate them. Uh, I had one mother call me a few years ago, and she said to me, she was walking down the street with a four-year-old, and, and her, I mean, I'm assuming this is what you're talking about. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. She, she's out there walking in the park, and and her daughter looked at two men carrying a baby, and she said, oh, we just learned about that in school today. That's two dads can ha can be a family, and the mother pulled her child out of school, and she said, okay, that's it. Yeah, no, they've got an agenda, and parents do need to be aware of that. Your children will grow up thinking all this stuff is normal, and it's now a lifestyle choice. And it's, it's so will it get to the stage where, yes. sorry, will it get to the stage where if you're homeschooling children, they'll have a representative to come down to see what you're teaching your children, and they may say that you have to add this in, into your syllabus? Yeah, no, that's another good point. It is if people keep homeschooling through the state, and that's why I really encourage people to disengage, because they are they're putting their tentacles tighter and tighter into the homeschooling community. Yeah, they want to be able to dictate. They're fine with you teaching your children at home, but they want your kids on computers and they want your children 
um, studying the things they want your children to study. And that, I mean, why are children learning about sex education anyways? Like, why is that even being taught in school? And that prior to the 60s, it, wasn't, it was never taught in school. It's a very bizarre thing to be teaching children. And people, parents are being taught, well, no, no, it protects children from child abuse. That's just rubbish. There's absolutely zero evidence for that. And it's really just exposing children to very inappropriate things at very, very young, young ages. And, and it's actually leading to more of this, um, like early sexual behavior and all the problems that go with that, like early teenage pregnancies and so forth and abortions. And now kids here can get, you know, I mean, they can do all these things without even parental consent anymore. And now they're trying to get them to pass vaccines so children get vaccines without parental consent. I mean, it's really, it's just the undermining of parental rights and parental authority is happening so quickly. And, and we're letting it happen. You know, one of our great Roman historians, Tacitus said that you can only tyrannize a people if they allow you to tyrannize them. It's our passivity that's allowing all these things to happen. Like we need to stand up and say no, and we're not doing it. And that's the most mind boggling thing to me. It's like, why are we letting these things happen? It's like, there's no collective movement. There's not a, a big enough collective movement to stop them. And, um, and the people that do try to, you know, there are people that do devote their lives to stopping these real wrong things that are happening and they get villainized, villainized for it, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the onus is on us. You know, it's, we are the parents and we have to protect our children. We have to make sure they're exposed to the right things at the right ages and in the right ways. And we're, we're really not doing our due, our due diligence. Okay, excellent. Now, that's the end of my questions. I've got a few questions from the community. Now, I think the answers may vary depending on whereabouts in the world you are. It's not too many questions. I won't take too much of your time. Um, but I'll ask you them anyway, and maybe the answers, people are getting a general idea anyway. The first question is, how much does it cost to homeschool? Uh, almost nothing. It really depends on how you homeschool. I'm, I, your parent, people spend a lot of money on things they don't need. And it's part of what I do. Like I, have, I have a program called the Smart Homeschooler Academy. So I, I'm going to walk you through the whole process, like why you want to homeschool a certain way, what material that you want to use. I show you how to teach your children. I show you how to raise your children with good character. And I, and I give you an idea of the, of the homeschooling lifestyle. So you can see it like this is a really fun thing you can be doing. You know, I mean, when I first thought of homeschooling, I, I, to me, it just sounded fun. I love the idea. So it can be really fun. Um, but, but there's things you need to know. There's some training that needs to go with it. So, yeah, so I... Um, I think, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, yeah, that's fine. Okay, the next question is, do homeschoolers do better than the public school peers on standardized tests? Actually, sorry, let me just back up. It was about cost. Yes, you, yeah. can, you can homeschool on a budget. And, and part of what I do in my program is I, I try to help people not spend money on stuff they don't need. There's a lot of very fancy stuff that you do not need for your children. You don't need to spend much, you really don't. The first year is going to be an investment. And every year you're going to make a, another investment for the for the next year. But your younger children, you don't have to get them anything. So it's really just each year you can make a little bit of an investment. But you can definitely start out, I would say, for about two hundred dollars. I, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking could be at the very core core curriculum. I want to say two hundred dollars. Uh, what is that like? One hundred fifty pounds. Uh, it's not. It doesn't have to be expensive. The biggest expense in homeschooling is that the mother cannot work. <laughs> That's the biggest expense. So, but there are ways you can get around that too. Let me just uh, touch on this because I do think it's important. It, it, I mean, we're, we're in a time where moms are working. We have to, it's like the cost of living has gotten so high everywhere. But one of the things that you can do if you are a mother who's working is you can start a little, you can offer to homeschool other people's children and you can charge for it. So you actually can't earn money that way. And it's a very noble service to do. A lot of mothers don't want their children in the system, but they, they have to work. And sometimes they're the only breadwinner. And so to offer that service is a wonderful thing to do and you can get paid for it. So you can actually earn your way. You can have an income while you're homeschooling. There's a, if you're creative, you can find ways to do this. You know, sometimes you're just working from home part time, you know, whatever you have to do to make it happen, you can do it. But yes, you can absolutely homeschool on a budget. You can buy used books. I mean, don't worry about cost. Don't, don't ever let cost be, be a factor because you could, you could work, you know, you can find ways to get around these things. Sounds good. So, so the next Ask me that one again, sorry. No, I'll do. It's, do homeschoolers do better than their public school peers on standardized tests? Well, I don't really have a, I mean, 
and my homeschoolers, I have no idea because I tell them not to, to take the test. Uh, but I homeschooled students do, do better. They, they tend to have more general knowledge. They tend to think more analytically. I, I want to say they think more, they think things through uh, more carefully. And they, they tend to have better reading comprehension. Um, so yes, typically they do do better. I, I, I forget what the percentage is. I think it's like 20% above uh, the government. I think, the, I think one of the concerns of today's time is, as well, especially as we're moving along, is that the the younger children are getting more pressure for them in terms of doing tests when this, they're even struggling to read and write. And then based on that, they're put in a, in a category of children. And it, it could be... Um, what could you say it could deflate them in terms of you know they're not done well they're in the bottom class or something so that can that's also a, a factor which affects the children's confidence absolutely and that's why you have to be really careful about when you put your if you're going to put your child in the school you need to really understand the right time to put your child in the school so that doesn't happen to them so typically boys and i don't like this idea that boys develop slower than girls and they're different than girls and it really comes down to the right and left brains and when they you know there's a middle section that needs to be developed so they can communicate until that happens the child's not ready for reading and that happens later in boys and it doesn't with girls boys need a lot of physical activity both children do the boys mm. need more and they need it for a longer period of time so the average age for reading readiness is about six and a half to seven for a girl that's average some girls will be earlier some will be later but that's average and for boys, it's not until seven to seven and a half. Some will be earlier and some will be later. I've known boys weren't ready till about nine. I'd say by about nine, they're ready. But that middle section starts developing around age seven uh, in girls and be a little later in boys. And it doesn't finish until around age nine. So true reading, uh, and until that, that until the brain is fully developed, that their children aren't doing what's called true reading. They're just using the right side of their brain. And the reason they don't, they end up not liking to read is because the right side is for visual things, right? It's where you start imagining the characters in the story and the scenery and what things look like. And when they're memorizing the word, like how to spell the word, what the word looks like, they don't, there's no room for that, that visual imagery, which is where a lot of the enjoyment in reading comes from, a lot of it comes from that. So they end up just not liking to read and they also just can't, like once they get older, they can't read a very advanced work. It's, and they're just not getting raised on good reading material either. So when you start teaching your children, it's very, very critical. I always tell parents, wait, wait, if you're going to put your child in a school, teach them to read first. Like, don't make them go through that in that, that system. Teach them to read at home. Excellent. Now, I know, obviously, from your experience and the amount of people that you work from different countries, like you said, you got people from the UK as well. Do you think a lot of parents still homeschool because of religious reasons? That's why they're taking children out of schools? I think people homeschool for um, different reasons, and definitely religion is one of them, and it should be. Your children are they're, they're being secularly, secularly educated in the system. So if you have a religion and if you want your children to share that religion with you, then you need to, you need to protect the environment that you're, you, you, need, you need to create the environment for your children that you want them to embody when they grow up. So if you want your child to be a scholar, you know, fill your house with books and, 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 and raise them in the company of scholars. If you want them to be an athlete, you know, Get them moving and, and surround them with athletes. If you want them to be an artist, surround them with artists, you know, and get them art supplies. If you want them to believe in God and, and to be, you know, to have a higher purpose in life in that respect, well, you need to raise them in that kind of an environment with people that share those values. And you're putting your children in school for eight hours a day and, and the best hours of their day. And, and you become the funny parent who's got these funny backward ways um, because they're going to listen to their peers and they're going to be, this, they're, they're, it, it's going to be ingrained in them to think a certain way in the system. So yes, I mean, if I were, if I, if, if that were my concern um, as a parent, whatever my concern is, you've got to create that environment for your children. So I, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. I think I had a few more questions, but I think you answered them anyway. One of the questions was, do homeschoolers have to take standardized tests? No, I don't know how it is in England. In America, no. If you don't, if you're not, if you're not plugged into the system, and so you're not, if, if you are homeschooling through the government, your child technically is a public school student, and they, yes, they do have to do the standardized testing. And, and the states vary too. There are some states where they have to do it. I think in third, eighth grade, or something like that. Um, in California, we have a lot of freedom. There's some states where there's just no controls at all. So it really depends on the state, but generally I want to say no. And if they do, 
it's very infrequent and it's not difficult for them to take a standardized test. You know, you just have to know what's going to be, you know, the material that's going to be on it, you know, and spend three months getting them ready for it. I mean, it's, it just isn't, what's demanded of kids in the system is not much and, and it should be a head when it comes from them anyway. Excellent. Now, I think a lot of people will definitely be interested now after you obviously our discussion that they may want further information. How can they, um, you know, um, follow you or where can they seem to get more information about yourself on what you do and maybe, you know, get a hold of you somehow? What's the best way forward for that? Yeah, so I, ha I have two programs um, that I, so one of them is on raising your child because those first seven years are very critical. And they're really the years where you raise the, the, the foundation, where you lay the foundation for your child. So you want your child to really develop emotion. You want them to reach that, you know, really a strong emotional state where they've got balance and they have control over themselves. And you want them to, you know, to develop physiologically and neurologically because that, that's going to affect their brain development, obviously. And so there's things that they need to do in their child to, childhood for that to happen. And then intellectually, you want to prepare them for an intellectual education in those for, in those early years. You don't want to give it to them. It's not the time. You prepare them for it so that when they are of the age and they're ready to read, or the first thing you're going to teach them formally, their minds are ripe for it and they're ready to go. And it's easy. You can teach a child to read in five minutes having done it. It's the easiest thing in the world. If they're at the right age, a piece of cake. I don't think you can do it. It's so easy. Um, so, yeah, so if you, if, um, so, so the first course that I have is, of course, on everything that you want to do to give your child a wholesome education so you can maximize their potential in all these areas so that they are right for academic learning when the, when the time comes and so that you can raise them with good characters as well. Or good characters. And then, so that's our parenting course. And then the homeschooling course is, you know, so now they're around age six, seven, you want, you need to start educating them. And you don't want to waste those years. They're very, they're, they're sponge-like years. I mean, children can learn so much during that period. You want to get those good learning habits in place too. And so if you start when your kids are young with me, by the time you're ready to homeschool them, you're just moving from one phase to another. But if you get your kids into the system too young and then you want to homeschool them, it's just not so easy. Uh, it really isn't. You're better off just starting out right and then it's just a smooth progression. Um, if you start out, the, if you do it the other way around, you can end up with kids who don't like learning, who don't see you as their teacher, who aren't, you, you know, there's not used to obey, you haven't learned how to manage them and so forth. You're going to end up, you're just going to end up with a struggle until you, until you figure out how to get it right. Um, so the Smart Homeschooler Academy deals with the elementary years of learning, very important years that you really want to get those right too. And so I just, like I said earlier, I just go over, the, over everything. So to find me, smarthomeschooler.com, it's easy to remember. So yeah. So final question for you for today, or uh, yeah, is do you recommend? Is there a book that you'd recommend for people to find out further information or learn about homeschooling on a general level? I don't recommend anything. I I I I recommend you take my course. There's so much misinformation out there about homeschooling, and there's so many different um, beliefs about what homeschooling is. And I, I I the only thing I can refer you to is my course. I think there you're going to get what you need, and you're going to get an accurate understanding. And you're going to really get a program that's going to help you really educate your child in the best way that you can. If you want to get, if you want to understand why you should do that, you need to read John Taylor Gatto. I would read, I have an essay um, that he let me publish at the first conference we did. Unfortunately, it's out of print. I'm trying to get it into an ebook format for parents. The Underground History of American Education. But that's where you want to start. But you need to really understand what he, what, what he, the knowledge that he brought to us because you need to understand why you don't want your children into the school system. He has a book called The Underground History of American Education. What happened in his last years is he was revising it. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes people get to an age where, you know, they just need kind of more guidance in what they're doing and the way they're thinking. And he, I, I don't think that book is as good as his original, The Underground History of, Amer of American Education. That's a big book and it's dense. And it, uh, let me just retract. Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gallup. That's where you want to start. Inexpensive book. It's a paperback. It's small. Very easy to read. But you'll, you'll get an understanding of what's going on. And then after that, I would go to YouTube. And he has, there's, he has a lot of talks there. Um, there's one in particular that's done by Hope and Tragedy. And I think it's for free on YouTube. But he, he, it, it's him on video talking about the underground history of American education. That's where you want to start. You need to have conviction. Because if you don't have that conviction, you know, there are times where you just don't feel like homeschooling. It's going to happen. Um, but, but 
you know, government schooling should never be a back door for you. You need to really shut that door. And, you, and the only way you're gonna shut is if you really understand what's going on. And John Taylor Gatt is your man. So dumbing us down. Yeah, I think I, I saw a title of one of John Taylor Gatt's books and it, I think it said, Weapons of Mass Destruction or something like that. That's a good one too. But I think the underground, I think dumbing us down is a place to start. And then you could do Weapons of Mass Destruction. That's also a good book. And just go watch some YouTube things by John. He, he just, yeah, a very brilliant man. And and I mean, everything we need to know about, about the history of education, as far as our own children are concerned. Yeah. Tells us. yeah. Elizabeth, thank you very much for taking time. I really appreciate you coming on. It's, it's great having you. I really enjoyed it today. It's a great honor. And I hope we can have another session maybe somewhere down the line when the situation changes around here maybe and we can talk about maybe if you get more people from the UK from us. <laughs> so um, it'd be good to hear from you again. Absolutely. Yes. No, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really okay. appreciate that you're, like I said, taking the time to really address this issue. It's so important. I mean, on a last thought, it's the power of one. Like one individual can really change the world. And if we really understand that we're raising a human being and, and who's that human being going to grow up to become? Like a lot of that is under our control in the beginning. And so we really, I just, I mean, it's an amazing thing to be a parent and then to be a teacher on top of that. And it just, it is an amazing thing to educate your own child. And so I really encourage you, if you feel inclined, just take it on. You're gonna find it so much easier than you may have been led to believe. And it, you're just gonna have a totally different experience raising your children. So the final words are, Check out smarthomeschooler.com. And dubbing us down. <laughs> thank you very much, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care.